I can't hear you. Yeah, thank you, Shiv Kumar. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Shalom, praise the Lord. Welcome uh, to class. Um, we'll begin our uh, study of uh, Romans chapter 8. We uh, studied verses 1 to verse 11 yesterday. We looked at the powerful verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that the spirit of him who raised Jesus back from death to life dwells in us, the same spirit who raised Jesus uh, back to life will also uh, quicken life or give life to our mortal uh, bodies. Okay, so we'll uh, continue from verse 11. Um, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? None of our uh, in-person students have joined in. Okay. Hi, Chira. What about the other students? They have not joined class? Hello, Chira. Okay. Prince, can you lead us in prayer, please? Can you hear us, ma'am? Yes, Hello? I can. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you for this, dear Lord Father. We thank you for the new session we are going, oh Lord Father. And Lord, uh, as we go and listen to your word, oh Lord Father, Holy Spirit, God, help us uh, uh, to understand every word that you are teaching us, oh Lord Father God. Uh, we submit our hearts, we submit our minds unto you. Uh, you come and do your work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, Prince. So uh, yesterday we uh, uh, studied verses 3 to verse 11 of uh, chapter um, 8. And uh, verse 11, we stopped there. The powerful verse says, But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in us. So uh, we see that this is a very powerful verse that we can speak over our uh, uh, lives, over our bodies, uh, you know, in any time, any season, because the Holy Spirit uh, quickens our um, mortal body through the life of the Spirit. So we can pray and say, God, touch my mortal body through your, through the life of your Spirit, give life to my uh, body. And we also saw the reason why Paul is writing this um, here in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And also, um, you know, he writes about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. We read that um, and we see why, because, uh, you know, I gave you an example about what happened to Paul in Acts chapter 14, verses 19 to uh, 21. We see how, you know, even though he was stoned and left, dragged and left for dead, you know, he caught up, he walked in the city and the very next day he goes and preaches and he uh, teaches. Okay, that is a supernatural work of God. That is the quickening of the work of the uh, Spirit. So when God can do that in Paul's life, he can do that in our lives um, as um, well. Okay, um, uh, as good as uh, that. I remember, you know, um, recently, uh, just a, I think two weeks back, I was supposed to preach somewhere and I was very, very unwell. My levels were very high uh, and I didn't think that I would be able to manage preaching and teaching. I didn't have that kind of energy and strength uh, because I was feeling too faint and weak and, uh, you know, my, my uh, levels were not doing well in my body. So I thought I'll call up the person and tell them that, you know, I've been unwell and then sorry, I won't be able to preach. So before I did that I actually prayed and uh, you know when I was praying um, God reminded me of this incident which I, I shared in Acts chapter 14 verses 19 to 21 where Paul was stoned and you know dragged and then the next day he got up and he rose up and went and preached so God, so God did not tell me hey you go and preach but 
you just gave me this incident just came in my spirit man like an, an impression and i knew what god wanted me to do and of course i went and preached and god enabled me and strengthened me and you know he took all the glory and the uh, honor okay so all of these scripture passages that have happened you know the narratives that we read and uh, god can bring that back to our memory he can speak through us even through that today but romans 8 is a very powerful verse that you can speak over your lives okay we'll move on to verses 12 to 17 because can somebody please read verses uh, 12 to 17 please can someone please read romans 8 12 to 17 please yes ma'am hmm. therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh but if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live for as many as are led by the spirit of god these are the sons of god for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out abba father the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god and if children then heirs and heirs of god and joint heirs with christ if indeed we suffer with him that we also be glorified together amen thank you prince so what is the conclusion of what paul has spoken so far in verse 12 he says therefore which means paul is saying okay i told you all this right up to verse 11 so let's sum it up okay now we need to remember that paul is speaking to the brethren he's speaking to the believers he's uh, told them that we are and he's saying that we are debtors not the flesh to live according to the flesh which means when our flesh cries out for attention uh, you know we need to tell the flesh that i don't owe you anything okay we we know paul has mentioned and told us that we are dead to the flesh you know but we are alive to the spirit but our flesh will still cry out for attention the flesh will still tell us to do things that are contrary to the spirit so when the flesh cries out what do we do we just tell our flesh that we don't owe you anything and we say that i don't have to pay you any attention or we don't have to give you uh, and we and, and we don't have to give in to the desires and the cravings and the drives or the passions of the uh, flesh okay so in verse 14 he says all of us who are sons of god are led by the spirit of god so if we are born again we know that we are sons and daughters of god and we are sons and daughters of god we know that we are led by the spirit of god the spirit of god leads us so we can pray every day and say god i'm your son i'm your daughter lead me uh, lead me to walk in the things of the spirit to yield to the things of the spirit and to give in to the things of the uh, spirit and not the things of the flesh verse 15 he says for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out abba father okay so again here he makes a contrast of the spirit of bondage and the spirit of adoption okay so he's if you look at uh, you know this chapter in the previous chapters he's constantly making you know a uh, comparison between the law of sin and death and the law of the spirit of life the law of sin the law of spirit or the uh, we are dead to the spirit we are uh, the de de dead to the law we are alive in the uh, spirit he talks about the carnal nature versus the uh, the, the spirit of nature or the, uh, carnality versus uh, spirituality so he's uh, making different contrasts and here also he makes a contrast of the spirit of bondage and the spirit of adoption now the spirit of bondage is a spirit that puts us into captivity but the spirit of adoption is what brings us into sonship and hence we are able to call god as abba father okay so when we are born again you know the spirit holy spirit in us testifies that we are children of god testifies of our adoption and he brings us into sonship and and you know we have this awareness that you know god is our father and hence we can call him abba 
father. Abba means, you know, a very close, intimate relationship that we have with the father. So we see, you know, here another new title for the Holy Spirit, um, Spirit of Adoption. So in this chapter, we have already seen Paul introducing the Holy Spirit as a spirit of life, the spirit of Christ, and now he's introducing him as a spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit does not put us in adoption, uh, uh, or uh, uh, sorry, the Holy Spirit does not put us in bondage or slavery and does not keep us in fear. Okay, so if anything that brings bondage and fear, we need to know that it's not of the Holy Spirit, it's not from God. Okay, but the Holy Spirit brings us into this wonderful place of being liberated sons and daughters. The spirit of adoption releases us to be the children of God. Okay, so when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, when we are born again, he testifies to us or he seals us that we are, he makes a seal that we are sons and daughters, you know, so he's a spirit of adoption and he uh, helps us to identify us ourselves as children of God or he releases us to be the children of God. So this helps us understand, you know, what is the work of the Spirit and what is not the work of the Holy Spirit. So there's a Holy Spirit that is a spirit of adoption and he's the one who liberates us. He's the one who gives us the freedom. He's the one that testifies that we are sons and daughters and hence we have our inheritors of the blessings of God, that we are heirs of God and that we are co-heirs of uh, Jesus Christ. So uh, when the Holy Spirit uh, testifies to us, convinces us that we are children. We have this wonderful privilege of being heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Okay. And in verse 16, it says, the, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And in verse 15, he says, we have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So how can we cry, Abba, Father? It's because the spirit bears witness with our spirit, like uh, he writes in verse 16. Because the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, hence, you know, we can cry out, Abba, Father. That means we can call out to God as our Abba, Father. So here, you know, uh, he's, uh, Paul is unveiling to us the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. He says, we are led by the Spirit, and now he's saying the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Okay, so Spirit himself bears witness means the Spirit himself testifies to us, or the Spirit himself speaks affirmingly or speaks convincingly that we are sons and daughters of God, or we are children of God. So the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, which means there is a communication with the Holy Spirit and our spirit. So we know we, you studied this in uh, the first year, the first semester in, uh, in the kingdom of God, you know, uh, uh, sorry, in the uh, fulfilling God's purpose for your life, receiving God's uh, guidance. You also learn about the Holy Spirit in the first semester. And also in the kingdom of God, we had a chapter on the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit bears witness in our spirit man. We are born again in our spirit man. So the Holy Spirit reveals the plans, the purposes, the things of God in our uh, spirit. So uh, in this chapter, we see that, you know, we learn a lot about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we learn that the Holy Spirit is the law of the spirit of life that helps us to overcome the flesh. That means the Holy Spirit is the uh, power, you know, uh, uh, the dominion of the spirit of life that helps us to overcome the flesh and he's a spirit of life that gives life to our mortal bodies verse 11 and he's also the spirit of life who um, uh, leads me all who are children of God are led by the spirit of um, uh, God uh, like we read in uh, verse 14 so in Romans chapter 8 Paul is basically unveiling to us many different uh, facets of the Holy Spirit or the different work of the Holy Spirit. He says he's the spirit of life who speaks to us. He bears witness in our spirit. 
Um, and, uh, you know, in verse 16, he says he bears witness within our spirit, uh, which means he's testifying to us, he's speaking, he's giving evidence, he's giving us conviction. And in this particular case, you know, he's the witness or the conviction, which means he's giving us, uh, uh, you know, uh, or telling us that we are the children of God. Okay. So this is our birth certificate right uh, how do we know that, that we are children of god or if somebody says how do you know that you're children of god or somebody asks you hey you know show me your birth certificate then you know we show them this the uh, this verse that says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are called children of god okay so you and i know that you know we are a child of god because the holy spirit bears witness in our uh, spirit man amen uh verse 16 so what is your uh, spiritual birth certificate romans chapter 8 verse uh, 16 how do you know that you're children of god somebody says you know show me your birth certificate your spiritual birth certificate show them uh was uh, romans chapter 8 verse 16 where it says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god okay Verse 17, and if children then hairs, hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Okay, so it says, and if children, okay, now this puts us in a place of, uh, you know, in a very, in a place of position, place of authority, in an honorable, esteemed position, because we are hairs of God and we are joint hairs with uh, Christ. So in this verse, he's basically using kingdom terminology. He's saying that we are heirs or we are a successor of God. We are joint heirs. So that means we are successors, joint successors with Christ Jesus. So who are we? Uh, who are you and I? We are heirs of God and we are joint heirs with uh, Christ. Joint heirs with Christ means that we share everything with Christ, which means whatever Christ has accomplished for us on the cross, you know, all that Paul has already conveyed to us or mentioned or written about it in chapters 5, 6, and 7, you know, we share all of that. Amen. So, you know, what Christ has accomplished for us, we share all of that, what he has done uh, for us, what he has uh, uh, provided for us on the cross and um, that is why we can say that we are joint heirs with Christ which means that we share everything with Christ in the latter part of verse 17 he says if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together now what is the suffering that Paul is mentioning here now the suffering which he has already uh, mentioned in verse 13 is in verse 13, he's mentioned about some suffering. He says, you know, put to death the deeds of the body. Okay. Now, this is a suffering he's mentioning about. And he calls it suffering because it is not easy. Okay. So what is the suffering that he's mentioning here um, uh, in verse 17 is that, you know, people suffer on the earth. And what is the suffering that they go through? They go through persecution, they go through challenges, they go through hardship. Uh, so that is a suffering that he's mentioning about here in verse 17, suffering of challenges, persecution, and hardship. But the suffering that he's mentioned in verse 13 is basically, you know, the suffering about the, the things in the flesh, you know, the, uh, the death that and corruption and decay, which is suffering in the flesh because of our sin. And so he's saying, put to death the deeds of the body. So that suffering is different, what he mentions in verse 13. But here in verse 17, what he's mentioning is uh, he's mentioning about, you know, the sufferings of uh, persecution, challenges, and um, hardships that we uh, face. So, you know, um, even as we put to death the deeds of the body, you know, we learned uh, when we looked at verses 3 to 11, uh, in verses 3 to 11 of Romans chapter 8, uh, even as we put to death the deeds of the body, uh, it causes us to glorify God and also causes us to walk in the spirit and, uh, you know, um, uh, and also causes us to be hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ 
Jesus. So putting to death the deeds of the body not only causes us to be glorified together, to walk in the glory, uh, uh, you know, uh, of being a hair and joint hair with Jesus Christ, but also, you know, it causes us uh, to, you know, um, uh, enjoy the future, uh, uh, you know, uh, glory that awaits us. Okay. So here he's saying that, you know, um, uh, even as we have already been glorified, how have we been glorified that we are being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus? You know, uh, we are already in a glorious position. We're already in a position um, where we are uh, in, a, uh, in an esteemed and honorable position. But even as we are in this glorious position, you know, uh, we will continue to suffer, we will go through problems and uh, difficulties, okay? Um, but, you know, we have this assurance that there is a future glory that awaits us that we can all enjoy, okay? Uh, so how do we walk in this glory that we have already received? How do we walk in this glory of uh, you know, that we have received of being hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ Jesus. Uh, you know, he says, if we suffer, we will be glorified together, which means he's saying that, you know, in the immediate context, yes, we will be going through a lot of suffering, but we will be glorified together means, of course, there is a future glory that we will enjoy with Christ uh, Jesus. Okay, so that is what he is uh, uh, talking about here in, uh, in in this verse, that if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Uh, did you all understand this? Or do you want me to explain again verse 17? Did you understand? Yes, no? Or do you want me to explain again? Okay. So here he's basically saying that, you know, what is the suffering? His suffering is persecution, challenges, and hardships. And, you know, we will suffer this even as we are here on this earth. You know, even though we have been in a, even though we are in a place of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, authority, even though we are in a place in an honorable and esteemed position, we will still uh, go through this suffering even though we are, glorified here on the earth, even as we walk in that glory that God has given us of being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. But even as we walk in this glory, he says that there is a future glory that we will all enjoy where we will be glorified to uh, together. Okay. So the immediate context, yes, we are going to suffering, but we will also be glorified together in the future. We will enjoy the glory that we will share with Jesus uh, Christ. Okay. So for us to walk in the glory of being hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ, we need to put to death the sinful deeds of the body. Uh, and how do we put uh, to death the uh, sinful deeds of the body? The, the answer, the key is the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we can ask this question, you know, uh, why are uh, believers you know, not able to live as hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ. You know, even though we have this honorable, esteemed position, even as it is something that we have a glorious position here of being hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ, why are believers not able to live uh, as hairs of God and joint hairs with Christ? It's because, you know, they are not willing to put to death the sinful deeds of the body. Okay, so if you are willing to put to crucify the the the, the carnal nature, the crying, uh, the flesh that is crying out and calling out for attention, if you are able to put to death the sinful deeds of the body and live in the spirit and walk in the spirit and be controlled by the spirit, then you know, we will be able to really live as hairs of God and joint hairs with uh, Christ Jesus, okay? Now, the Holy Spirit who lives in us, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, and who is a spirit of adoption, uh, makes us children of God in the spiritual realm, and he has also made us as hairs and joint hairs of Jesus Christ. 
Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the answer, and His Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to overcome the law of sin and death. That means to overcome the power and the dominion, the control of sin and death. And He is helping us to overcome the sinful deeds of the body. He is the one who is leading us. Uh, because we are the children of God and he is the spirit of adoption who has brought us into the family of God and he is the one who's bearing the witness with our spirit that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So in the spiritual realm, this is our understanding and even as this is our understanding and our identity in the spiritual realm you know god wants us to conduct our lives here on the earth you know the practical way as hairs of god and joint hairs with christ amen okay any questions uh from verse 12 to verse 17 any questions you'll have Okay, if no questions, then we will move on to verses 18 to verse 23. So can somebody read that, please? Verses 18 to 23. Verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, futility not willingly, but because of him who subjected, subjected in it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, pangs, pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Amen. Thank you, Prince. Now, this passage is quite unique because Paul, what Paul shares here, you know, he does not share anywhere else in any other episode. So it's quite important. And uh, let's look at these verses. Okay. Verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he's saying, uh, you know, uh, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time. He's referring to the corruption and the bondage of creation. Okay. And he's also pointing to our future glory. Now we are going through earthly sufferings. And he's already spoken about that in uh, verse 17. Okay. He says we are going through earthly suffering. And part of it, uh, a part of the suffering is that he has also, he's, which is already mentioned in the preceding verses, has to do also with the crucifixion of the flesh or crucifying the flesh. But he's saying, but there is something more glorious coming up. And what is that? He says in verse 19, for those, for the earnest except. Uh, sorry, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So here he's saying that, you know, even creation is eagerly waiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. You know, we are already sons of God. We are already hairs. We're already joint hairs with Christ Jesus. All this is already done. But he's saying there is something more that is coming up. And he's saying that even creation is looking forward for that. Okay. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, all of creation is subjected to futility. Futility means, you know, to destruction, uh, to futile things. And this was not the will of God for, you know, creation to go this way or for uh, for this to happen in creation. Uh, we, uh, uh, we need to know very clearly here that God did not willingly subject creation to 
uh, futility. It was not his will that, you know, uh, creation um, uh, should be ineffective, useless, you know, it's pointless, uh, the creation that he had created. It was not his will. It was not what God had intended. But Paul says God allowed creation to be subjected to futility. That means he allowed vain things to uh, to take place uh, on this earth, you know, uh, 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 you know, he uh, he uh, has allowed uh, destruction and uh, you know creation to be destructive. Now, why did he allow it? It was because of man's choice. Okay, when when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, we know that all of creation was also subjected to uh, futility, for corruption, for decay, and for uh, destruction. But God is saying, you know. Even though I have allowed this to happen, you know, uh, I'm even as I'm, I'm letting go uh, of uh, the beautiful creation that I created to be perfect and beautiful. Uh, but even as I'm, you know, letting it be subject to destruction and to uh, uh, unfruitfulness, he's saying I'm doing that with the anticipation of the future hope. You know that you know one day all of mankind and all of creation will be redeemed yes we are redeemed in part now but there will be a time when we will experience full redemption when our bodies will also experience the full um, redemption so the uh, uh, eternal life that we are experiencing now is not something that the eternal life, the promise of eternal life is not something that is way into the future. It's not just something, a hope that we look up to. It's not an eschatological hope, something that is a uh, hope in the future, but it's also a realized eschatology. That means it's something that, you know, it's a hope that will be fully seen in the future, but we can also realize that hope, we can taste it, we can live that here in the present life that we are living here on the um, earth, okay? So, verse 21, he says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, okay? So, at the future time, There'll be a time when, you know, creation will also be released from this bondage of uh, corruption. But in the present moment, creation now is under the bondage of corruption because of sin. Okay. And the great liberty or redemption that the children of God will experience is when our bodies will be redeemed from being uh, mortal to immortal. And, you know, in the same way, creation will also be, be uh, will also be uh, reinstated to its original position, to its original place, to the original design and perfection that God created it to be. Okay. Verse 22 uh, he says, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So creation is going through such a pain, uh, like, you know, a woman uh, in labor who goes through intense, immense pain. So he says it is this intense pain, but, you know, even as creation is going through this intense and immense pain, it will give birth to uh, something okay just like a woman in labor goes through intense pain but you know something wonderful happens uh, you know when the baby is born all the pain is forgotten because of the joy of seeing this uh, you know the birth of um, uh, this little one this beautiful creation that god has created okay so this intent there is intense pain but this um but even in this pain, there is an expectation that something wonderful will happen. Okay. Verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even be ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Okay. So not only uh, that, but we who are the first fruits of the spirit means He's basically talking to the believers in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And he says, we too are groaning or we too are suffering. So we too are also eagerly waiting for the adoption or the redemption of our 
body. We are also looking for, forward to the glorious time when, you know, our bodies will be delivered from corruption, from uh, decay, from death, from pain. And, you know, that, uh, you, uh, that glorious togetherness uh, with, the, uh, with, uh, with Christ, that we will experience this future hope. You know, we too, as uh, humans, are eagerly looking forward for this adoption, for this redemption of our body. Now, Paul mentions in verse 21, the glorious liberty of the children of God. Do you remember that? In verse 21, he spoke about the glorious liberty of the children of God. And he's referring to the time of redemption of our bodies, when our bodies will be fully and completely, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, redeemed. Uh, and in the sense that, you know, mort mort uh, uh, mortal will put on immortality and, you know, where our bodies will no longer be subject to pain, suffering, sickness, infirmity, and uh, to physical death. But, you know, our bodies will put on immortality and there will be no pain and uh, suffering. Now we can ask this question, why is Paul talking about this in, uh, or mentioning this in this passage? Now, you know, we need to remember that when Adam sinned, not only did Adam come into subjection to sin and Satan, but also the whole world came into subjection to sin, Satan and death. So all of creation uh, you know, um, also, you know, came into bondage and corruption uh, at the fall. And it came into subjection to the working of death, which is decay. And ever since that, there has been a downward decline uh, in, crea in creation. And we see so much of that in our world today. There's also a deviation from God's original design and plan that he uh, uh, created things that he, you know, uh, what he had created, the original plan and design. There has been a big deviation from that original plan and design. Now, this was not God's original plan. It was not his design. It was not how he created the world. But because of sin, you know, sin brought about uh, corruption and deviation from God's original design and purpose and the perfect state that God created a creation to be. So why is there suffering in the world today? Because all of creation is under corruption and bondage. Why do we fall sick? Why can we you know, catch various uh, infectious disease and have, you know, face accidents and face other problems? Because you know, we are living in a, in a world uh, or uh, because creation is under corruption and bondage. And God has allowed this subjection because of the future hope when he is, you know, going to redeem all of creation like he's going to redeem mankind. And this future hope of the glorious uh, uh, full redemption that is going to take place. So uh, let's look at a few cross references. Uh, can somebody please read Colossians 1 verse 20 and somebody else can read uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14. Can one of you please read Colossians 1 20 and someone else can read Ephesians 1 14 please. Um, I'm Colossians 1 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Um, thank you, Francis. So what is God working towards? Um, you know, he's working towards, you know, this thing that, you know, through Christ, he is going to reconcile all things to himself. He is going to bring it all back. You know, yes, he let it go, not willingly, as we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 20. But, you know, uh, he let it go, uh, not willingly for a time period, because he knew that he knows that through what Jesus did on the cross, he will reconcile all things back to himself. Okay. Can someone else please read Ephesians 1, 14, please? Ephesians 1, 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? Amen. Thank you, Nina Santosh. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a deposit, as a guarantee. 
okay until uh, which means you know there is more to come so until the redemption of the purchase possession so which means that we are partly redeemed you know uh, we are still you know even though we are redeemed even though we are tasting eternal life here and now we do have sickness problems difficulties sufferings challenges that we face but we are partly redeemed now but we will be fully redeemed and the holy spirit is given to us as a deposit it's a guarantee he's he is given to us like a guarantee saying that hey there is more to come there is full redemption there is you know full deliverance there's full redemption into the perfect bodies the perfect creation that god created us to be and what he intended and designed creation to be okay now coming back to romans 8 you know we suffer in this world and we wonder why uh, you know um, it's because uh, creation is subject to corruption and decay, but there is this hope, this glorious liberty for the children of God, the redemption of our bodies, when God will redeem all things back to himself uh, and to his original position. Amen. So this is our hope and this is our confidence that we have. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, move forward. Uh, verses 24 to 28. So can somebody read that, please? 24 to 28. Romans chapter 8, 24 to 28. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For we does one still hope for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also help in our weak weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we out. But the Spirit himself make intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows that the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to will of God. And we know that all things work to gather for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Thank you, Francis. So Paul is saying here that we have this hope of the redemption of all things in creation and also redemption of our bodies. And he says, but hope that is seen is not hope. You know, we cannot see it. You know, uh, if we see it, there is no need for hope, right? Uh, but we cannot see it. And because we cannot see it, that is why we have this hope. Hope is something, you know, that we are looking to happen way in the future, okay? And all we can do is, you know, wait for it in patience, with endurance, and in perseverance. And interestingly, Paul, you know, moves on or he transitions to prayer. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Now, what is the weaknesses is he talking about here? In the overall context, he's talking about the weakness of our flesh because he's been talking about that in the last few chapters and this chapter as well so this is the overarching theme uh, you know starting from romans chapter 6 that paul has been talking about uh, which is the weakness of our flesh but in the immediate preceding context paul is talking about the sufferings in the present time which is corruption and decay in creation and you know the demonic work satan bringing all about his suffering uh, wicked people who you know plan wicked things against those who believe and trust in god so there are times when we go through sufferings in life and we feel weak and we don't want to pray okay so whether it's the weakness of the flesh or the journey of the sufferings of life in this present time, you know, whether it's in context with the corruption and decay of the world, because we're suffering because of the evil that is in the world, or because the wicked people in this world trying to do wicked things against us, whatever it is, it is you know, God says, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm there with you. And sometimes we do not know what to pray in these situations, but, you know, the Holy Spirit, 
whom Paul has introduced to us, you know, who helps us in our weakness. He also helps us make intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So the same Holy Spirit, which he introduced to us as someone who is our helper, who helps us in our weakness, he's saying is the same Holy Spirit who makes intercessions with us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. And what does he do? Uh, he, uh, uh, he uh, you know, he intercedes along with us. He does it with us or he does it through us. Okay. Uh, uh, he says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. The word helps in the Greek literally means uh, to take hold of together with us or against. Okay, I'll repeat that. Uh, the word help in the Greek literally means to take hold together with us or against. Okay, so the Holy Spirit takes a hold of us or, you know, together with us and against our weaknesses, he helps us to pray. So it's not the Holy Spirit, you know, praying somewhere for us. No, he's praying together with us, along with us. And whether it is the weakness of the flesh or the suffering of the present time, you know, he uh, takes a hold of us and together with us, he prays for this, uh, the weakness that we are facing, whether it is the weakness of the flesh, the sufferings of the flesh or the present uh, time. Uh, for situations that we do not know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit takes a hold of us or together with us and against um, means against the things that are coming against us, the weakness of our flesh or our sufferings. And it says with groanings that cannot be uttered, which means the expression comes from the Holy Spirit. He is giving us the words. It's the actual intercession uh, uh, you know, is happening, but it's coming in the form of groaning that cannot be expressed through our speech. So groaning is the inarticulate speech, is something that we cannot utter with our words, uh, but it can be expressed in tongues when we pray in tongues, you know, when we are crying and weeping, whatever fashion, you know, these groanings can be uttered okay but it's not coming through our speech but it's coming from the holy spirit is inarticulate speech it can be uh, you know expressed in our tongues whether through uh, crying or you know or speaking in tongues or in whatever fashion but it's a holy spirit releasing it through the life of the believer okay verse 27 he says he who searches the heart he says now, you know, he's, uh, when he says he who searches the heart, you know, now he's coming back to the heart of the individual. He's saying God is looking into the hearts of the individual. So where are these groanings being released from, you know, uh, from God? And it's released where? In the heart of the believer. Okay. So this prayer, this intercession that helps us in our weakness comes from the Holy Spirit and is released into the heart of, uh, of man or is released in our spirit man and uh, how are how is this intercession coming it's coming through groanings which cannot be uh, expressed through our own words and that's why he says but god looks into our hearts and he says he knows what the mind of the spirit is so god knows what the holy spirit is saying because the intercession is the intercession of the saints according to the will of God. It is perfect intercession, which means we are praying just as God wants us to pray. So when he says he knows the mind of the Spirit is, it says God knows what the Holy Spirit is saying, okay, or what the Holy Spirit is interceding on behalf of us. It is the intercession of the saints, but it is according to the will of God. And it's a perfect intercession because we are praying just as God wants us to pray. So just to summarize this verse, who is having the weakness? It's the saints, the believers, you know, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. Who is helping us in prayer? It's the Holy Spirit. And how is he helping us? You know, he is helping us by making intercession through us, uh, against us, against all the things that are coming, uh, uh, you know, against us, our weaknesses, the weaknesses of the flesh and the things of this world. Okay. And who is doing the intercession? The believer is doing the intercession with the help of the Holy Spirit. And where is the intercession coming from? 
you know the heart of the believer okay uh, and who is listening god is listening to us okay so he looks into the heart of the believer and he knows what the holy spirit is saying because he knows the mind of the spirit and this intercession is according to the will of god okay so when you don't know what to pray for in situations the holy spirit is helping us to pray according to the will of god and it's coming out as groaning uh, meaning it's prayer and it's coming from the holy spirit and it's being expressed through inarticulate speech so groaning and it's not something the believer you know is making things up because the groaning can be expressed in tongues crying and weeping in whatever fashion and the result is if we are praying according to the will of god and you know it's helping the saints in their weakness okay we'll stop here uh, we'll continue uh, on tuesday any questions any questions no questions okay uh, we'll end class here thank you everyone uh, and we'll continue on tuesday